Who's ready to place the program on the wall? The World Coconut Championships is held on the first Saturday in June every year in Tavistock, Ontario. The tournament started in 1999, so it has been 25 years. It started just as a meeting up of people who are both interested in Crokinole and then also some community people who are just really excited about having like a top tier world class event uh, in their communities. We've been trying to put on the biggest Crokinole tournament in the world and definitely in our history as well. Uh, so yeah, I've been running around trying to make sure everything's running smoothly and uh, in addition to that, you know, playing a little bit as well. <laughs> Crokinole is a game uh, that's played by players flicking wooden discs across the board. Uh, the objective of the game is to score more points uh, than your opponent by pushing your disc closer towards the middle and simultaneously demoting the scores of the opposing discs. The scoring ranges are 5 points from the outside, 10 from the next circle in, the 15 circles encased in a set of pegs, and then in the middle is a recess hole worth 20 points. In 1999, there was just shy of, of 200 people who attended the World Coconut Championships, and now in 2024, we've had just shy of 400 people. People mostly came from Ontario, definitely again being the hotbed, but uh, different provinces were represented, so BC, PI, Nova Scotia, Quebec. Um, players from 15 different U.S. states came, and from some of the very far away states like Alaska and Washington and California. And we also had some international competitors, so one competitor from Japan who was quite good, and he's playing in uh, he's advanced to the playoff round here today. Um, and another competitor as well from Australia and from Sweden. My name is Ryotaro Fukuda. I'm from Japan. My name is James Sullivan, and I'm here from New York City. My name is Dale Henry. I'm from the Tuscarora Nations, First Nations. My name is Harry Blaine. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and I'm here via Sacramento, California. I'm Justin Graff, and I'm Prashant Bakken, and we're both coming in from Detroit, Michigan. I'm Patrick Tenike, and I'm here from Iowa City, Iowa. I'm Taylor. I'm from London, Ontario. I'm Piper, and I'm from India. One of the great things about Crokinole is how accessible it is. So at the World Championships, even, we've had today uh, a competitor as young as five and one as old as 92, which is quite a range. Congratulations. Very big. The Crokinole's history is somewhat murky. It's not clear exactly where it came from. The word is definitely a French word. Um, but it seems like in Ontario is where the game at least took off, perhaps originated from as well. Um, there was a lot of board makers in the early 1900s that came from, uh, from southern Ontario. And they, the game, as uh, progressed over time, has definitely been most popular within southern Ontario. So the very first known board that can be actually verified to a particular date was built in 1876 outside of Tavistock. Here is our famous board. Oof. Ooh, isn't it lovely? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an impressive amount of detail. What can you tell me about it? So this board was made by Eckhart Wettleffer for his five-year-old son, Adam, for his fifth birthday, which dates the board to um, 1876. And that makes it one of the, if not the, oldest documented crokinole board, uh, at least in Canada, if not the world. Eckhart was uh, a wagon maker, and he would have, as part of his job, done a lot of very intricate painting on uh, the wagons he made. So that's why we believe it has such an elaborate pattern on it and is quite beautifully done. And this doesn't look like it's played on too much. No. So apparently Adam wasn't a big fan of the game and actually rarely played it. So it usually hung on uh, his bedroom wall. Um, so that helps explain why it's in such great condition. Lovely, so uh, if the World Championships needs another board, can we, can we grab this one? Uh, unfortunately, no, we can't uh, lend it out. Uh, and actually, it usually isn't even on display. It's uh, in our storage facility under climate controlled conditions, um, but we're happy to pull it out for visitors if they give us advance notice. Uh, we do like to share this particular piece from our collection. Awesome. We have a lot of top quality boards out here. There should be no food, water, or drink in the playing area. Normally we have to cap off our registrations because we don't have enough boards or enough tables to service all those players. This year though, we kind of went the extra mile, tried to actually acquire more tables, more boards, and actually the cap that we're running into now is we actually just can't fit more boards on the arena surface. Every board that's on the floor today uh, was or is being made in Elmira. Elmira is about a 40 minute drive from Tavistock. Tracy Boards, Jeremy speaking. My name is Jeremy Tracy. I am the owner of Tracy Boards. I am absolutely blessed to work with my entire family. My wife Elaine and I are uh, owners and all three of our sons 
are, uh, are involved in the business. Our oldest son, Reed, is the production manager. Our youngest son, Nolan, looks after fulfillment, all customer service emails. And our middle son, Garrett, does all the social media, TikTok-y stuff that uh, is out of my realm. <laughs> I had grown up playing just friendly, casual crokinole. But as soon as I got involved in tournaments, of course, I learned about the World Crokinole Championships and uh, started playing the first chance I got. And it was a few years after that that I became the, the board builder and, and the official board builder for the World Crokinole Championships. I was looking for an opportunity and a friend came to me and mentioned that Willard Martin was looking to retire from board building after 30 years. And uh, Willard and I met, hit it off, and he basically took me in as an apprentice. Morning, Jerry. How are you guys, sir? I got the day number I got started by taking the business over from my father who wanted to retire and he was well into his 80s. It's cool. Yeah. In 1988, my father was featured in a crokinole story in yep. a magazine. It was quite labor intensive in those days because he put the lines on by hand. Everything was done by hand and he did them one at a time. That made a pretty good board. He made crokinole boards for about 20 some years and I made crokinole boards for 33 years. Well, first of all, right off the pop, you've got to have good finish. The finish needs to be very smooth, very quick, very fast. And if you don't start with good material, you'll never have a good board. In this area, I would say most homes have a crokinole board. It's very common to have, especially amongst the more conservative people. The reason that it was always acceptable in the homes was because it was never connotated with gambling. People would comment to me, well, don't you ever get sick and tired of making crokinole boards? I said, no, not if I try to make the next one better than the last one. The popularity is absolutely growing. And when I initially met Willard, he told me that him and his brother Bruce were building three to 500 boards a year. That was our goal to get to that. And uh, once it started to explode, we quickly jumped to 900 boards and then it was 1800 boards. Last year we did 2800 boards and we are still continuing to grow. I would estimate that this calendar year we're probably looking in around the 4,000. Probably 90% of our retail is going into the U.S., but we're also seeing it grow in the U.K., the rest of Europe, Australia, and literally all over the world. My sons and I all play at an extremely high level, and we often say, we're not gonna sell a board that we wouldn't want to play on. That's something we remind ourselves, and I talk with my staff about it, is that, you know what, this might be the 20th top you sand today, but it's somebody's only board. Crokinole isn't a contact sport, but uh, people do take it quite seriously and I know for sure and I know from experience like people when, when they don't win are, are quite disappointed and when they do win they are quite elated. Uh, Justin Slade is one of our top players. He's won the world championships more than anybody else. He's won it five times. I've been playing uh, Crokinole since I was a kid, but I started playing competitively in 2009, so about 15 years. It's a story similar to many where you know you have a board at the cottage and you know it's an old rusted thing. When we were kids, I was always the worst crokinole player of my brothers because I, um, my, my brothers are, are both older than me. And so I was always worse than them. And in any game we'd ever play, I was always worse than them, mainly because I was younger. And so I think I developed a very competitive spirit uh, through that. Very, very strong player. Um, you know, had a reputation for scoring a lot of open 20s, uh, being a very good 20 shooter early on. But his game is really, really refined. The, the key skill uh, to being good at crokinole is being able to shoot your disc in a straight line. And that involves a lot of hand-eye coordination, involves a lot of patience, it involves a lot of um, practice. And just being able to make your disc go where you need it to go. And as, as soon as you can do that, the rest of the game is very easy. Um, another strong player is Connor Ryman. He's the current world champion. And he is really a guy whose 20 scoring is, is incredible. And he often goes for 20s when perhaps they're not even needed. I'm the only person who came from the States who's won the World Cup Championship. So in the U.S., crokinole is still relatively little known. It is, it's played by small but dedicated groups. When I was really getting going, I used to practice several hours a day. I would come home from, uh, come home from school and just sort of shoot for a little while uh, and not come up until I heard, oh, yeah, suffer's on. And, uh, and there, uh, new crokinole clubs are cropping up all over the country. The thing I like most about crokinole is the community. 
the, uh, the group of people that you get out here on this, on this arena floor is astonishing. When I come up from the States for these tournaments, they've, uh, they've fed me and, uh, and given me a bed to sleep in, and, uh, and we play quite a lot. It's, uh, it's a really wonderful community. I've met several of my closest friends in this group. The players are very, very competitive. There is no one, obviously, who wants to lose, and lots, lots and lots of people are really driven to win. We're in the semifinals right now, so it's the big four that everybody was expecting, and the big two, uh, Justin Slater and Connor Ryman, are actually facing each other in the semifinals, so it should be interesting to see who wins. I still don't know how to handle the nerves. We're working on it, but, uh, but it's still it's a work in progress. The nerves, you know, it's a, it's a small world, Crokinone, to be sure, but, uh, but it matters. It matters, and it bothers you when you get up into those high-stakes games, you know. There's, uh, there's no way to, way to describe it. The grand prize for winning the competitive singles competition is $1,000. There's $1,000 on the line. It's time to get serious. felt like he wasn't missing anything, um, so yeah, I don't know how to beat someone who doesn't miss anything. So until I figure that out, uh, I guess until we meet again. <laughs> you know. It's time for the finals to begin, mm -hmm. and the World Championship of the Pro 2024 will take place between Connor Ryman and Josh Carafello. I'm exhausted, I'm overwhelmed, but I'm on cloud nine, obviously. That's, that's, that's a great win. The planning for the 2025 World Coconut Championship starts almost immediately after the 2024 World Championships ends. Uh, our next committee meeting is actually just one week after the tournament is done, so yeah, pretty much right away, about 51 weeks in advance, we'll be starting again.